Oxford University researchers Carl Benedict Frey and Michael A. Osborne caused a tremendous stir in 2013 when they asserted in a seminal paper that AI would put 47% of current U.S. employment at risk. The paper, titled The Future of Employment, is a rigorous and detailed historical review of research on the effect of technology innovation on labor markets and employment. In a recent research paper, McKinsey found that only about 5% of occupations could be fully automated by adapting current technology. However, today's technologies could automate 45% of the activities people are paid to perform across all occupations. What's more, about 60% of all occupations could see 30% or more of their work activities automated. Some of the scaremongering that I've seen, you know, it's kind of, uh, it doesn't feel too far away for people. So some people are already fed up with the conversation. As soon as new buzzwords come in like AI and machine learning and deep learning and stuff like that, there's obviously the people kind of in the media that kind of try and flip it. But there's certain things like I'm seeing, you know, cognitive technologies coming through where in the HR function, it's, it's not five to ten years away, I don't think, for some of these things. Um, and certainly with shared service centers, where, which are pretty robotic jobs. I call these slave centers. Yeah. Um, that's the way I look at them because they're devoid of, of, of skill, skill sets where people are learning how to project manage, how to communicate, call how to centers, manage. Call centers are going to yeah. be toast in the next two or three years. Toast, I like this word, yeah. toast. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're going to have a lot of the other jobs beginning to be automated in, in the next three to five years. So yeah. there is re reason to worry, which, which is why the work you're doing mm. on the future of work is important because we need to raise awareness and more importantly, we need to make the workforce aware of what's going to happen to them. That, you know, it used to be that when you graduated, you, you, you know, when I was young, my parents used to tell me, look, you should be a doctor or an engineer. In our generation, you're not that, that young, my friend, but in our generation, <laughs> <laughs> we, did, we, we selected a career um, when we were young, right? And then we studied for it, and that, that career was supposed to last a lifetime. The half-life of a career now is about five years. Okay, that's sure. really how fast things are changing. That we're going to have multiple careers in our lifetime. It used to be that, that learning stopped when you graduated. Now learning has to start when you graduate because if you don't keep your skills current, you're going to be toast. Yeah. It's, there's almost a certainty that if you're not staying abreast of all the latest technology changes and all the, all, all the new things that are happening, you will be unemployed. And it's not going to be your company's fault. It's your fault because you didn't keep put, open your eyes and start learning about the new things that were happening. You know, take a simple example. Five years ago, um, the CEOs of companies didn't use, most companies didn't use email. Today, you don't use email, you're toast. Yeah. Because your board members do, so the executives use email. Right. It used to be that um, the way you managed was by, you know, it used to be hierarchical, top yep. down that uh, you would get a memo from the uh, CEO every year or so tell, defining what the strategic vision was and that's when you heard from your CEO and, and so on. Now you're hearing from your CEO practically every week. You basically have to communicate. You manage by communication, not by, not by you know, trying to control or command. Now everyone has a voice. That before the gossip would be spread around the water cooler. Now you're cop blind copied on you know, 100 emails every day. It's very transparent. A exactly. Work. Anything that happens anywhere in the company, you know about it about 10 minutes later. Yeah. You can't hide facts anymore. So everything is changing in the workplace. Everything is changing in the way you manage. Everything is changing in the way you control. Everything is changing in the way you look for um, threats to your business. Everything is changing rapidly. And how do we deal with this? This is the thing for me, and it's part of the reason why I've, I've come to you today. Um, one, of, one of those clients, you know, on the AI space where it's going to kill all those shared service jobs, and we're from Budapest, you know, uh, half the jobs there, and it's a lot of young people, these are the jobs they're in. They're not aware that these jobs are going to be replaced by machines. And it's very clear, it's the tier one, tier two jobs are going to be gone. There's still the need for customer service, but mm, you know. Not, not sure about that. <laughs> okay, we'll have that conversation look, look as at the well. New, look at the new uh, bots that are coming. For example, uh, yesterday Google announced their you know, home products. Right. Right. These little bots can talk to you. 
yeah. you can carry conversations with them. Uh, Amazon is offering a $2.5 million prize to anyone who can develop the AI software that can have a conversation for 20 minutes you know, with you. <laughs> These things are getting pretty darn good. Right. I give it another year or two before they can do high quality customer service. We so won't be able to tell the difference. We won't be able to tell the difference. If you, like I said, if you listen to the, the output of Google's new voice synthesis technology, yeah. it sounds pretty human-like. The old stuff didn't, but this is based on deep learning. Yeah. It sounds very human-like. Yeah. You can't tell the difference, really. It does. It's, it's a massive revolution, isn't it? I, mean, I don't think. And most, again, I don't most think people, people are not aware it. of it. People yeah, are not aware of it. it. Yeah. I mean, because we're on this exponential curve. People are used to look to linear, you know, flat progressions of technology where you could see what was happening. Linear you can't see anymore. Uh -huh. Yeah, now it's exponential. Everything is changing rapidly. It's multiple technologies advancing exponentially and converging. And when the convergence happens, industries get wiped out. So the, back to your question as to what can people do? It depends on what level you're at. If you're the CEO of a company, you better start now understanding uh, various technologies, the convergences, and you better start shifting your strategies because you can't be organized the way you were before, which was in divisions where people focused on only on one technology, on one type of thing. You need to rethink the way you run the company, the way you do innovation, the way you're organized, structured, the way you look at the competition, the way you market, sell, everything from the CEO level. If you're an employee, you better now realize that um, there's a you know, greater than 50% likelihood that no matter what job you're doing, it's going to become obsolete in the next five, seven years or so. So the onus is on you to start learning the things I'm talking about. So if AI is a threat to jobs, I tell you, learning AI and, and being able to apply it to different areas is an opportunity. Yeah. Because AI can be applied to anything where data is needed. And data is everywhere. I mean, we have sensors everywhere now. The cameras are sensors. We have heat sensors, light sensors. We have traffic sensors, pollution sensors. All these sensors, we have wearables, wearables that are all yeah. gathering data, right? Uh, our genome has been sequenced. The cost of sequencing will drop to about $100 within the next three or four years, which means that everyone will be sequenced. Our microbiome will be sequenced. So in other words, data, 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 data. So yes, people in Silicon Valley working on some applications, but the number of applications of this, of this technology are almost endless. Because even though um, you, know, you have people in tech centers in Silicon Valley and the world solving some problems, the, the range of problems is almost infinite. There are billion problems to solve. Well, if you can now learn these technologies, you can now be at the forefront of change and be providing tremendous value. And you can be now, you know, it's not that, uh, you can be uh, part of the elite, elite few that get paid the mega bucks and that benefit from the change. Be at the forefront of it. Is it going to help the 1%? Is it going to help the one percent, that dynamic? The 1% are going to become richer. The, the, the Zuckerbergs are going to go from being billionaires to being trillionaires. So that's inevitable. Are you, you know, for a tolerance for society out there to kind of allow this to keep I'm going? I'm terrified about it. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I see, I, I just finished the manuscript of a book which is going to be out in the first quarter of next year called Driver and the Driverless Car. The theme of the book is that we have a choice of what we do with technology and if we get it right, we build Star Trek, 300 years ahead of schedule. If we get it wrong, we build Mad Max. What's the future then for the next, say, let's, let's be realistic here, the, the kind of where people, I think our audience would like to know, you know, in terms of what's working, what's become irrelevant, and, and kind of the next two or three years. Next two or three years are more of the same. Next five to 10 years become amazing, scary at the same time. So, and, and next 15 years or so, really, I see Mad Max or Star Trek. And I'm the optimist. I, I think we'll get to Star Trek because humanity will get its act together. We will get beyond you know, the craziness that we're seeing and we will figure out how to share the prosperity and to uplift humanity. And I think we're going to have Star Trek 300 years ahead of schedule. The future of work, do you experience, you know, what's your experience of the world? No, the world, future heard... of work, it's, it's going to be a roller coaster. Mm -hmm. um, you either learn and adapt or you perish. It's that simple. I hate to be this blunt, yeah. but really you must start learning about the things I'm talking about you must start learning how to reposition yourself, how to uplift yourself. You must start preparing yourself for an uncertain career because everything's going to be changing. And really my view is that if we get this right, if we can share the prosperity, then we win. Yeah. We create Star Trek because at the end of the day, who wants to work 50 hours a week? Right. What if we could live a lifestyle, have all of our basic needs met, have unlimited health care, education, you know, energy, have all the food we want, have you know, you know, safe, clean housing and we only have to work 10 hours a week. Thank you very much, sure. Vivek. Thanks a million for having us here today. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. If you would like to learn more about how you can be involved in our research and events on the future of work, subscribe to our channel now and visit our website.